Good morning and welcome to Morning Movie News. Yesterday was a very big day for Warner Brothers where they made two huge headlines. And it's hard to decide which is the bigger headline. I guess it depends on if you're a comic book fan or a horror fan. But these days a lot of people are both. And that's largely thanks to James Wan who's done a wonderful job of bringing horror into the mainstream. So we'll start with James Wan and the very big news yesterday that he will be returning to direct The Conjuring 2. What? I thought he graduated to action with Fast and Furious 7. He made a big deal about it. We thought he wasn't coming back, at least for a little while. He was going to stick around to produce as he produced Annabelle, uh, which I think is part of what made this happen with him coming back so quickly to horror, but he has come back quite quickly. Uh, and uh, you have to wonder what the different factors are for his return. I'm sure one is lots of money and power, which is what New Line probably offered him to make this deal happen, because they realize that he is a talent they want to have in their stable. And Warner Brothers is a very talent-driven studio, impressively so, and of course, New Line is one of their divisions. They have Ben Affleck, they work in, they're working very hard to keep Christopher Nolan, although I don't know if they'll be able to. I think his loyalty is more to Legendary. Uh, but, you know, and also they have Zack Snyder, and that's a lot of talent that Jeff Robinoff built during his run at the studio. And of course, he had to leave. He was pushed out by Kevin Sujihara, and he started his own production company. He has his own funding, and I believe he's going over to Sony. But anyway, Warner Brothers has kept his game plan, you know, his playbook of being a talent-based studio and having those relationships. I apologize they're doing, again, some construction outside, so there'll just be a little bit of interruptions then in there. It's not too bad, thank goodness. But anyway, Warner Brothers is remaining a talent-based studio, and James Wan is one of the talents that they want to be in business with. So this deal is he's going to return for The Conjuring 2, he'll be directing it, and he also is going to do other movies there. And of course there was a lot of speculation, and you know, we'll tie in comic books yet again, that uh, he would maybe would ta be taking over a DC movie. I don't believe he has a deal with Warner Brothers proper, just with New Line, but you never know how things could shake out, uh, and clearly Warner Brothers as a company as a whole as I said, wants to be in the James Wan business. Uh, but, you know, I wish he was taking over Doctor Strange, don't you? Uh, but that's, of course, a Marvel property. Uh, maybe you know, they should think of him for Sandman, perhaps, uh, with Joseph Gordon-Levitt, although uh, I think Joseph Gordon-Levitt's only confirmed to produce right now. If I were Joseph Gordon-Levitt, I'd be on the phone saying, what can we do to put me in a room with James Wan? And this is very exciting for James Wan, uh, but it leads to a couple of other questions. But first off, they first announced that The Conjuring 2 was being pushed back a year before the James Wan news. And that made sense alone to me because of how cro crowded October 2015 and the general fall season has become for next year with horror. You've got Crimson Peak, the Guillermo del Toro hotly anticipated Victorian horror film, Haunted House movie. But then also you have Victor Frankenstein coming out around that time, I believe, with James McAvoy and Daniel Radcliffe. Very competitive year for horror um, and also a very highbrow year for horror, um, more so than usual. And I think that's what made The Conjuring, the first one, stand out, that it was a Shining-esque level movie in terms of production values and sophistication, and as I said, again, highbrow. So The Conjuring wouldn't be as special if it came out in October 2015, but maybe in October 2016, I mean, October 2016, it can have the room it needs to just vacuum up money left and right. And I'm really glad that James Wan is returning because I think it's such an important franchise and he guided Annabelle to be such a success, which of course is a spin-off of The Conjuring, that I think they want to make sure that they this is an important franchise to Warner Brothers and they want to make sure it's in the right hands. And they've done that. Now, in, able to, in order to do this, they had to have a deal with Universal, much like uh, you know, um, Fox had to let Mark Webb go to, to, to direct Sony's Spider-Man movies. And that's the whole reason you saw an X-Men preview at the end of The Amazing Spider-Man 2 as part of that deal. Uh, because Universal has an option on Juan to direct Fast and Furious 8. Uh, but I think there's a couple things going on there. Now, of course, Fast and Furious 7, due to the tragic death of Paul Walker, was delayed more than anyone could have possibly imagined. Uh, and I think it really threw a lot of things into question. I think it threw into question the success of the, uh, the seventh entry by itself. And also, if the uh, franchise could continue beyond the seventh entry, can they make a Fast and Furious 8? Or, you know, is this going to be a goodbye to Paul Walker and the franchise? Uh, it's a really interesting and important question, which we'll get our answer to when Fast 7 hits theaters, but I'm sure that's what Universal is partially waiting on. They're like, we don't know if we want to continue with this franchise. We don't know how it's going to be received. So we're putting everything in a holding pattern. Let's make nice with Warner Brothers. Maybe that'll come into handy down the, uh, come in hand later down the line. 
and let James Wan go and uh, make these movies. So a very exciting deal. And I think James Wan, you know, should have feel there's no shame in returning to horror. It's clearly his niche. And I think he is making it mainstream. Uh, and I think he would be better off just like Marvel is very um, smartly adding other genres to the comic book mix to create something new and fresh, that maybe James Wan can take horror in different directions. And maybe that would be the key to his success. I'm telling you, Sandman uh, or any DC horror property, sign up James Wan. I think he would do a very, very good job. He's a very talented director. All right, so that's the first big headline of the day. What else did Warner Brothers come up with? Well, everybody was very excited, particularly Static Shock fans, which became the big headline out of a larger announcement that Warner Brothers is moving aggressively into the digital space with a new uh, label called Blue Ribbon Content. And that's what they're going to call their digital content. Now, again, as I said, they're moving very aggressively into the space with a wide spectrum of content. Uh, including virtual reality, which we'll get to in a moment. But let's focus on the uh, the story that made the most out of this larger announcement, and that's the Static Shock digital series. Now, uh, there's a lot of digital content coming out online. CBS is starting a streaming uh, service. Netflix, of course, is uh, leading the way for highbrow digital content. So maybe this is Warner Brothers' answer to the Netflix deal, although they're doing it totally in-house. I mean, they're distributing on their own. So Static Shock will be a, a digital series. We don't know how many episodes it will get, you know, no casting announcements, but we do know that behind the scenes, Reginald Hudlin, who helped produce uh, Django Unchained, is going to be involved. And I think that's going to make Reginald Hudlin a really a force to be reckoned with in terms of getting black talent on the screen in genre roles. There's people like Tyler Perry and Will Packer who are doing a great job with comedy and drama. But, you know, so far in the, uh, in the genre area, there hasn't been so much ground that's been... Uh, tread, but I think Reginald Hudlin is doing a great job in making that happen. Now, we'll see how responsible he was for Django Unchained. He might have just helped get the movie made, but I think, of course, Quentin Tarantino has incredible uh, ownership and authorship over the final film. So we'll see what Reginald Hudlin can do on his own. And then, of course, sadly, Dwayne McDuffie passed away and has did not get to live to see this, uh, to see his character join Warner Brothers' current movement, comic book movement, uh, even if it is in a secondary role. But, you know, digital is becoming quite big, so it could be a big deal for them. Uh, but Milestone Comics, which has become Milestone Media, has, uh, and Dwayne McDuffie, by the way, created Static Shock, uh, but his, his company, Milestone Comics, which has worked very hard to put, uh, you know, heroes of color into into the comic book marketplace with varying degrees of success, but not so much success because obviously most people haven't heard of Milestone Comics, but again, Milestone Media is the new company, the new in, um, incarnation, and they're going to be involved with this show as well. So I think that's very exciting, and I think it'll be interesting to see if they can get some kind of traction behind this uh, the way they have with Arrow and The Flash, but at the same time, uh, they're not bringing those characters into their movies. What, where will the digital space live? Will that be even more uh, separated or will it be, uh, you know, spun into the television shows of Static Shock is success or will he be spun into the movies? I think they have a lot of diversity already on their movie slate. I would suspect him to go to the TV route. But Static Shock, a very beloved character by his fan base, uh, so I, let's hope that he gets the support he needs in this digital series. So just really f quickly, the other stuff that they announced for Blue Ribbon content, a Mortal Kombat series, uh, which is going to play into the movie in the game that's coming out. I believe it's a game, actually, from Warner Brothers Interactive. So they're using, you know, you're seeing a lot of synergy here, which is good. I mean, that's been Disney's hallmark for a long time now. We'll talk about that with the viewer question of the day. Uh, and so it's great to see Warner Brothers trying to implement that strategy as well, because it's worked quite well for Disney. Uh, and then also uh, you have the Mortal Kombat show. Also, you have the Justice League animated show, which was announced earlier. That's part of this. So it's going to air on Machinima to help promote uh, Batman v Superman, uh, which is largely like Justice League 0.5, you know, like the, the prologue uh, leading up to our Justice League movie. Uh, and then, of course, this virtual reality project. What is that? Well, you're going to be able to, through some technology that some people have, uh, you're going to be able to feel like you're in the Batcave. And not just any Batcave, but the Batcave from the animated series. Bruce Timm will be involved in this, just like he's involved with the Justice League show with Blue Ribbon content. Uh, and, you know, that's going to make you feel like you're in the Batcave. And I'm sure you can look stuff up and, you know, read about it, I guess, you know, the Batpedia, and find out what's going on. I question how much technology like this is out there, and if it's worth this kind of effort uh, to create something specifically for those users. But if it's a high-end market, and they feel that this uh, stuff's going to get out there, they want to get out in front 
front of the technology, well then more power to them. Although I have to say, I hope there's a version for those of us who don't want to fork over the money for virtual reality glasses for ourselves so that we can kind of enjoy it as well. They must, I'm sure they'll be creating that kind of alternative option. All right, so that's the second story of the day. And I'm curious to what you think of how Warner Brothers is doing in the digital space because we all have our concerns about how they're doing in every other space. All right, now, on to the third story of the day. This has to do with Disney. We're kind of segueing. You know, uh, Fox, though, is still, I believe, the biggest studio of the year in terms of box office, but our conversations these days so often boil down to Disney versus Warner Brothers. It's very interesting. So we're going to segue over to Disney, and they are uh, they've, lost, they've given up. They didn't lose them because they didn't do anything with the property, but they've given away the John Carter rights. They let them expire. So John Carter has reverted back to the Edgar Rice Burroughs estate, and the Edgar Rice Burroughs estate has stated that they're going to be very aggressive with these rights to get them out to another studio. Studio. They are behind the Tarzan picture. They're very excited about that. That's, of course, the Alexander Skarsgård Margot Robbie film, or as I like to call it, Fifty Shades of Green, because why else would you hire those actors unless you wanted them to get naked? Uh, we'll see how that does. I think the casting is off on both characters, even though I like I'm, I like Alexander Skarsgård. I'm starting to like Margot Robbie more. I liked her on Pan Am. Didn't like her in Wolf of Wall Street. Uh, I have a little bit of a problem with what she stands for in terms of actresses and how they get ahead, you know, uh, having to do nudity. I would say people are trying to sell her as a new Michelle Pfeiffer, whereas I would say she's more the new Sharon Stone. We'll see which way she goes. Uh, but anyway, Tarzan, they're hoping, is a big hit. We'll see how that turns out. Uh, but now they really want to make sure somebody to pick up John Carter. I don't know if anyone's going to pick up John Carter, consider, considering how poorly the Disney version did. And I have to say, as I did when I reviewed the film, I liked John Carter. I thought it was a very well-made film. I thought Andrew Stanton did a very nice job. And I really wanted to return to that world. When the movie ended, I wanted a sequel. Uh, I think the, the real problem with that film was just the worst marketing campaign ever. And of course, Disney did let that marketing campaign director go, who was for a while handling their publicity department. It was a big, you know, embarrassing story for her. She did not get along with anybody internally either, you know, from a political standpoint. And then, of course, she couldn't deliver in her job with actually getting people to show up for the movie. So she's gone. And I wonder what a John Carter 2 would look like uh, if it had had a better marketing campaign behind it. And also if Andrew Stanton knew a little bit better, you know, there was uh, some discussion about how him not being used to doing live action filmmaking. And so unfortunately, he didn't film any big action sequences up front so they could be ready for the first trailers. Uh, but John Carter, great movie. I think it's worth your time, although a little bit less now because that that world will never, never be returned to, and it's likely that somewhere down the line, some other studio and some other creative talent are going to reboot John Carter. And I think somebody should. I would say if they're going to do that going forward, I would rely even more heavily on the Frank Franzetta artwork, uh, kind of like what they tried to do with Hercules uh, in the flashback sequences to the, you know, Hercules' feats of glory. I thought that was very impressive, but that's something even that movie didn't utilize. So I'd love to see a 300-type application to John Carter, something really interesting and playing off, you know, the beefcake and cheesecake, something for everyone uh, that was it's so popular and part of uh, the image of John Carter. I would really like to see that uh, come into play. But I'm curious, do you, do you want to see someone else tackle John Carter, or are you done with it? Uh, what did you think of the Disney movie? Uh, and do you have any faith in Edgar Rice Burroughs' properties going forward, either a John Carter reboot or this Tarzan film? All right, so those are the three stories of the day. Now, the viewer question is, it's kind of a viewer question. It's something a lot of people ask me to discuss, and I got a, a, an unusual number of you know, tweets and emails about it, and that's the announcement of when the Avengers Age of Ultron trailer is going to debut. And I think it's very interesting and very telling, and it shows uh, more Disney synergy, but a change of synergy from what we saw with Guardians of the Galaxy. Now, as you might recall, Guardians of the Galaxy premiered its trailer on Jimmy Kimmel, and not only did they premiere it on the Jimmy Kimmel show, uh, but then it became exclusive to Jimmy Kimmel's YouTube page for 24 hours. Uh, that's a pretty big deal, and it was done right when Jimmy Fallon was launching his show in competition. So you have Jimmy versus Jimmy, and the Disney company very much wanted to give uh, Kimmel an edge by giving him this Guardians of the Galaxy trailer. And then throughout the Guardians of the Galaxy run, they did a lot to promote that movie on Jimmy Kimmel's show. And I expect to see a parade of Avengers on Kimmel as well. But not the trailer. The trailer is being put on Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. So they announced late last night, I don't watch Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., so thank you everybody for letting me know. Uh, and it, you know, quickly made headlines across the internet. They're debuting the first trailer for Avengers Age of Ultron uh, October 28th during the, the show when it airs at 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Now, I think that's very interesting. Now, I, I doubt it will be an exclusive because there's no Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. Uh, YouTube page. It might be a Marvel exclusive. We'll see. I'll try and get my review up as fast as possible. You know, of course, allowing for the fact that there will be um, possibly an exclusive. That means you have to give 24 hours. That's becoming more popular with the big trailers. That's something Lionsgate does, and you just have to give them their 
uh, exclusivity, um, you know, window, exclusive window. That's just the that's just the politics of it all. Uh, but interestingly, um, to air it during uh, 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 Agents of Shield, I think is a, is an interesting choice because this is a show that obviously does need help. But I think that it's is it's, it's, it's a lost cause. If I were in the room and they were like, "When should we air uh, the Avengers: Age of Ultron trailer?" I'd be like, and they'd be like, "Agents of Shield." I'd be like, "No." Nope. Just let it die. And I know a number of you really like that show, and you're saying it's gotten much better, but I just don't think there's any coming back. And I think Gotham will soon join it, by the way. I'm still enjoying Gotham, even though it's getting increasingly cheesy uh, with each episode, but it's slipping in the ratings. It's falling. It's losing. It's hemorrhaging viewers. Uh, it's slowly, I, not hemorrhaging, it's bleeding out very slowly all over Fox's Monday night <laughs> uh, programming schedule. But it's very unfortunate, but I can see the flaws and why it's not working. I think at the end of the day, in my opinion, episodic, the episodic nature of network television doesn't fit with the sophisticated storytelling that viewers have come to expect of their comic book content. Uh, that's why I think these shows need to go to cable or Netflix or maybe blue ribbon content. But anyway, I think it's interesting to help uh, Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. when I think Big Hero 6 needs a lot of help. And I would have debuted this trailer, I would not have released it on the internet, and I would have said if you want to see the Avengers Age of Ultron trailer, you need to go see Big Hero 6. It's a Marvel animated property, uh, it ties in beautifully, and I need something to compete with Interstellar. Instead though, they're airing this trailer, what, what is it going in front of? That, that weekend, the only big movie that comes out is Nightcrawler for Halloween. Uh, that's the Jake Gyllenhaal, uh, you know, uh, Tony Gilroy's brother Dan hit their film. Uh, that's coming out. That's not a big movie. So what are they attaching this trailer to? Clearly, they don't want to attach it to a movie. They're not trying to benefit a film. You know, they're just wanting to, they, they think that they can drop that trailer whenever they want, which is true, and they're using it to try and help Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. So we'll see what happens. We'll see if it boosts the rating for the show. But I think a lot of people know it's going to show up online very shortly after, and I don't think it's going to get anybody to watch anyway. So we'll see what happens, but I'm curious to what you guys think of this decision. Do you think Disney made the right choice to back this, or would you have deb debuted it on Kimmel? Would you have debuted it on Big Hero 6? Or would you have just dropped it on the internet? Uh, as we have come to expect. Write your thoughts down below. Thank you so much for tuning in today. Uh, uh, write your thoughts da down below about today's top three stories, the viewer question, anything you'd like to see covered tomorrow, any questions that you might have. Thanks for watching.